All right, as you find your way back to your seats, we'll be in Galatians this evening, Galatians chapter 1. We'll look at uh, verses 15 through 24. Wanted to spend some time just for this evening, the Lord willing, away from Daniel. Wanted to look at a message that I've called the gospel, or the power of the gospel uh, to really help us to consider what our Savior's done. In just a few minutes here, we're going to observe the Lord's table. We're going to, uh, in this, uh, as I mentioned, um, this will be an act of worship an act of remembrance, what our Savior has done. And, and we do so corporately. This is something that we as, as a local church are expected to do by our Savior until He comes. And we do so uh, thankfully. Uh, but also this needs to be a, a moment of reflection where we are looking in our hearts and we are making sure that we are doing what the Lord would have us to do and living in such a way that He is pleased. And, and in, first, or in Galatians chapter 1, uh, we consider the difference that the gospel made in Paul's life, the difference that it made in saving him. Uh, we know that the, the gospel is called, he calls it in Romans chapter 1, the power of God unto salvation. And the power of God can take somebody who was a complete wretch, somebody who had nothing, wanted nothing to do with God, and can turn them into somebody who preaches very faithfully and consistently the word of God itself. Uh, there have been people within the last century or so that we can think of that have had a dramatic change in their lives. I think of the evangelist Billy Sunday. You probably know that name, Billy Sunday, a man who was known uh, in that day, first of all, as a baseball player. He played professional baseball and uh, was beyond that known as a partier. Uh, he had a terrible mouth. He was a drinker and in many ways was, was the exact opposite of what you would expect a preacher to be. And yet, you know, he wasn't saved yet. He was also a gambler. And uh, one day, he went to the Pacific Garden Mission there in Chicago, and he heard the gospel, and he was saved. And this was a, a dramatic transformation in Billy Sunday's life. Uh, he, he turned away from those vices that had consumed his life and taken his attention, and he turned his focus on the Lord. God called him to preach, and that man would go on to preach around the world, preach the gospel. Uh, it's estimated that he preached some 300 revival meetings and had the opportunity to minister to over 100 million people. Only the Lord knows how many of those got saved, but he had a dramatic ministry that God gave him because he gave himself over to the power of the gospel. And, and he is a, was a wonderful testimony of the difference that the gospel can make and the sheer power that can take somebody who was such an obvious overt sinner and turn them into somebody who is equally as obvious and overt in his witness. And we think of the Apostle Paul, if you're, you're hopefully by now in Galatians chapter 1 and we know that the testimony of the Apostle Paul, he has shared some of that here in Galatians chapter 1. He'll also, he's done so, and we'll look at this in Philippians chapter 3. In both cases and throughout his ministry, he was doing battle with the Judaizers. Uh, you know that group. I've talked about them before. I preached through the book of Galatians two years ago. And these were very pious, religious, zealous Jews who tried to undo his ministry and bind those who were giving their lives to Jesus Christ, whether they were Jew or Gentile, trying to bind those people to the law. And trying to take, okay, you, you believe in, in Jesus Christ by faith, okay, that's fine, but you also need to be Jewish in order for God to be pleased with you. You need to be circumcised and you need to follow the Jewish diet at all of these works in order to be saved and and the Galatians, if you remember, they had, in the, the absence of Paul, they had believed this false gospel, believed these false teachings, and had given themselves over to these false things, and the, the Judaizers seemed to be having their day. Paul catches wind of it by the, the direction of the Holy Spirit, and he writes this letter to the churches in the region of Galatia to combat the false teaching and to really direct their attention back to Jesus Christ where it belonged. And as we consider the testimony of the Apostle Paul, you see somebody in whose life the gospel had a, a night and day difference, a dramatic difference. Paul, uh, as Saul, that was a, his Hebrew name, Paul is the Greek rendering of that name, and uh, as Saul of Tarsus, he was a Pharisee, he was very religious, very zealous in his religion, uh, he hated Christians. He hated everything that had to do with them. And uh, uh, the day that he got saved, he had letters in hand to go to Damascus and to wreak havoc on the church. And he would have done so had he not had an interaction with Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus shined his light upon Saul 
and, and Saul acknowledged that Jesus was the Lord and uh, he was saved shortly thereafter. The man who had been a terrible persecutor of the church would turn into one of the most dramatic preachers of the gospel. And it wasn't because of any gifting that he had. It wasn't because of his superior intellect or anything like that. It was because of the effect of the power of the gospel. It changes a person. Look at your heart. If you're saved here tonight, look at the change that has taken place in your heart, not because of you, but because of Christ, because of the power of his gospel. In, in Romans, I read Romans 1, verse 16 this morning, uh, For I am not ashamed of the, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That power didn't run out the day we got saved, folks, nor did your need for the gospel. We need the gospel every single day. And it's there for us. That power that saved us and is powerful enough to sustain that and to keep us for eternity is enough to help us change to become more like our Savior Jesus Christ. And that's what the, the Apostle Paul had to experience. And through his testimony, we can experience as well. We can enjoy the power of the gospel in our lives. And so we're going to look at verses 15 through 24 this evening in a message that I've entitled, The Power of the Gospel. And first, I'd like us to see a change in conviction. My screen is broken in the back. I'll probably have to replace it. So I'm going to, again, have to turn to my right. Uh, my girls this afternoon wanted to... Uh, watch my message from this morning so I pulled up YouTube and it was there and and they asked me daddy why do you keep turning to the right and well because the TV was broken so uh, just get used to it I'm gonna turn and try to keep track of things if I miss it then hopefully Cliff can keep me honest back there but we're gonna look at a change in conviction let's look at Galatians 1 verses 15 I'm gonna read the whole passage here and then we'll hone in on verses 15 and 16 for this first point. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now he says this because he was accused of basically just copying and pasting the other apostles. He was, he was accused of being an inferior apostle. His, his message wasn't worth much, that he got what he had from other people and was just repeating it. And his point was, when I got saved and when the Lord put this burden on me, I didn't get my doctrine from other people. I got it from the Lord himself. I got this from him, straight from, straight from the Lord, and, and really trying to combat the, the mud that these Judaizers were slinging at him. Verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went unto Arabia and returned again into, unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. There was a change of conviction in this man. Uh, his initial conviction, his initial, his initial heart as a Pharisee, as an unsaved person, was to glorify himself. As you looked at the Pharisees, that's what they did. As we have seen in the Gospel of John, if you were to consult the other Gospels, you see the Pharisees nonstop trying to draw attention to themselves. Even in Jesus' parable where you have the Pharisee and the publican coming to pray, the Pharisee comes and he's getting everybody's attention. Hey, look at me. I'm going to pray in a loud way so that everybody can see just how spiritual I am. And God, I thank you that I'm not like this sinner over here. He, he failed to acknowledge his own sin, that his sin, which he was hiding under a shiny veneer was just as wicked as this publican. The difference was this publican humbled himself and he was bowing down and asking for forgiveness from the Lord and, and trying to draw closer to him. The Pharisees wanted nothing to do that. It was all just show. Jesus even confronted them and called them out on this, calling them whitewashed sepulchers. Basically a painted grave. You make the outside look beautiful and shiny and, and new. Inside, what is it full of? He says, dead man's bones. And that was what the Pharisees were. That's what Paul was. And his heart was, as a Pharisee and as an unsaved person, hardwired to glorify himself. Very much like the Judaizers, whose, whose message he was combating here. And they had come, we, if you were to look back in uh, verses 6 and 7, they came with a perverted, twisted gospel, another gospel. This is something, a completely foreign substance. It wasn't the true gospel of Christ. They, they 
perverted it and twisted it. And Paul says, anybody comes to you with a perverted, twisted gospel, let them be accursed. This is strong language, but Paul had no time for people who were going to twist God's word and pull people away. Jesus didn't either. Now, Jesus gave them opportunity after opportunity, but eventually we have in Matthew 23 where Jesus pronounces woe after woe after woe on the hypocrites, these people who should have known better, really did know better, and still chose to lead God's people astray. And the Judaizers fit into that mold. So did the Apostle Paul before his salvation. Paul referred back to his former mindset in order to expose the hypocrisy and the pride of the false teachers. He's not in this account nor in in Philippians 3, which we'll see in a few minutes. He was not lifting himself up. He was not exalting himself. He was showing that that former mentality had no place any longer. It, It was of no value. Look just a few verses back in verses 13 and 14. We'll see him go through this. For ye have heard of my conversation, or how he lived in time past in the Jews' religion. How, and, and just, I'll pause again to mention that the Galatians were Gentiles. And so they needed to be made aware of his, his past and the Jews' religion specifically. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Again, not to elevate himself or to puff himself up, but to point out the fact that I had it wrong. I had my priorities completely wrong. Before, all I lived for was me. I think we all need to say the same thing about ourselves. That's our tendency, and even as as Christians, we still struggle with the tendency to make it all about us, to elevate ourselves, elevate what we've done, and when we do so, we get man's praise, but we don't get God's, and God doesn't get the glory. We're not here for us, folks. I'm not here for me. You're not here for you. You're not here for other people to notice how great and spiritual and wonderful you are. You're here to magnify the Lord, so we need to do it. That's what the Apostle Paul was pointing out to the Judaizers and helping the Galatians to understand that there's no place for glorifying self. And the power of the gospel helps us get beyond that to the point where we are willing to glorify the Savior. The change that took place in Paul's heart displays the power of the gospel that he loved, preached, and for which he died. The man who used to exalt himself and look to his achievements and his piety for purpose now humbled himself. He knew his place now. He knew that the universe didn't revolve around him. I would say that He was content to exalt Jesus Christ above himself, but the word content is probably too weak to really describe how Paul loved his Savior. He was ecstatic at every opportunity that he had, every chance he was given to glorify the one that he loved and the one that saved him. Hold your place here and go to Philippians 3. As promised, we'll look at that passage. Some more uh, very pointed language here for these Judaizers. But he's doing so as a a rebuke to them, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but also to help the churches to whom he's writing to understand just how serious it is that you stay on track, that you stay right with the Lord and not give yourself over to false teachings. Uh, Verse 1 of Philippians chapter 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. We need reminders. We need reminders often, don't we? Verse 2, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Talking about um, complete total mutilation, just complete removal there. Uh, he, he basically is saying these, these Judaizers elevate specifically the work of circumcision. And he's saying, he's twisting the word a little bit and saying these people deserve just to be mutilated, to be completely, uh, to, to be cut off in that sense. Um, they are, are getting it wrong. Life in Christ does not revolve around outside works, and that's all that they cared about. Verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might have also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Benjamin, of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm sorry, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I'll point out again, he is not in this 
respect, glorifying himself. He's saying, this used to matter to me. This is what I lived for. This is what life was all about. But he'll correct that very quickly here. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. I was willing to turn those things over and to stop pursuing them. Everything that I had built up until that point, I was willing to just throw it away. Why? Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency, uh, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Folks, this, this verse needs to be our goal, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. That's what life was all about now for him. That's what life needs to be about for us as Christians, knowing our Savior better. And what happens when we know our Savior better? We want to sin less. Because the more we get to know our Savior, the more we realize how serious sin is for him. You don't die for something that's not serious, folks. And Jesus died because of our sins. You don't intentionally cut off fellowship with somebody for something that's not serious. Jesus was willing to be cut off from his Father on that cross because sin is serious. Can I ask you, believer, is it serious for you? How seriously do we take sin? How much do we hate it? Not enough. Not enough. There was a change in commission for the Apostle Paul. He was a persecutor. Verse, uh, go back to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I'll read the last few verses of the chapter, starting in verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went unto Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. They didn't have YouTube, so they couldn't just look up a preacher. Now they would have heard things, and he says as much, but they hadn't seen his face yet. And many of them were thankful that up until that point they had not seen his face. It would have bode ill for them. Verse 23 But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. He was a former persecutor. He had a lot to overcome once he got saved. Don't we all? Didn't we all? Every day of our lives, don't we all? In addition to his own personal spiritual growth, Paul had to grow away from his past and let Christ write his future, and if you were to, we won't at, for sake of time tonight, but if you were to go back to the book of Acts, to the passage where Paul is saved, shortly after he gets saved, Barnabas comes, and, and the man uses, uh, the Lord uses Barnabas to really help Saul, help Paul get off his feet, help Paul to be encouraged, and as Paul is going around trying to get with other Christians to enjoy that fellowship, they knew who he was. And they were understandably apprehensive. And if you heard, you think of somebody in your mind that is a a fierce persecutor, and if that person all of a sudden came to Christ, and you heard, hey, this this person's going to be in our church service, you're going to be looking over your shoulder. You're going to be a little bit concerned. If you're packing heat, you're going to be hanging on to that heat and, and be watching the door, watching this person. And, and so you, you think, okay, well, they say he's saved, but I, I'll believe it when I see it. And Barnabas was willing to take this man that everybody was afraid of and, and that they doubted, again, understandably, and he was, he was able to vouch for him, willing to vouch for him and mentor him and help give him hope when nobody else would. He would give him a chance when nobody else would. Maybe you've got somebody like that in your life, somebody who, when nobody else would give you a chance, this person loved you, this person mentored you, they discipled you, they stuck by you stuck up for you. I'm thankful for Barnabas, because without Barnabas, Paul wouldn't have been who he became, but the Lord used him in a tremendous way. But he was a former persecutor. The devil has a way, and you've experienced this, I've experienced this, the devil has a way of taking our past and putting it right in front of our face. Why does he do that? 
because then we focus on it. And when we're focused on our past, we're not looking to what God has for us in the future. We're not even looking at what he has for us right now. To use an illustration that I've used before, when you're driving a car, the, the primary place that you look as a driver is that front window. You look out the windshield. Why? Because you don't want to crash. You're going forward, you look forward. You look out that front window, it's the biggest opening in the car on purpose so that you can clearly see where you need to go. Now you have mirrors that help you see what's behind you, and that's necessary. It's good to see what's behind you, especially if you're backing up. But even if you're driving, let's say you're on the highway and you need to change lanes, it's helpful to see what's, what's behind you so that you know that it's safe to merge. But you don't spend your whole trip looking in the rearview mirror. Why? You'll crash. God doesn't want us to spend our whole life looking in the rearview mirror. It's in the past. Now, it's helpful for us to be aware of what's in the past so that we can grow, so that we can learn, so we can see failures that we've had and see the grace of God to overcome those failures and to see, I don't want to go back there, and by the Lord's grace, I never will. By His grace, I'm going to keep stepping forward for Him. But He can use those failures to help us to grow, but Satan would use those failures to make us stop. He would use those failures as a roadblock to keep us from going anywhere. Because a Christian who is immobile is not doing anything for the Lord, and that's exactly the kind of Christian Satan loves. I believe that Satan may have heard. He's not omnipresent, not omniscient, but I believe he may have heard uh, maybe the Lord talking to Ananias, talking to others about his plan for Paul, how he's going to use him to, to speak to kings and, and do all this wonderful stuff. And I believe that he saw the, the early impact of the, the life of Paul on those that he met, and he wanted to attack him. He wanted to take him down. He wanted to take him out of the game. And Satan does that with God's servants. But what, what he had been was not who he was. God saved him, and so he no longer had to wear that badge of dishonor. He was saved by grace through faith. As far as Jesus was concerned, he was no longer a persecutor. He was no longer that wicked, nasty sinner. He was, he was a saint. He was a sinner saved by grace, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Aren't you glad about that? And so this former persecutor became a faithful preacher. He became a faithful preacher. Look in verses 23 and 24. But um, I'll go back to verse 22. And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. God gave Paul regular victory over this struggle, though it wouldn't have come easy. But Paul knew that he had a specific calling from God, and nothing was going to stop him from faithfully fulfilling God's purpose for him. Whatever is in your past, you can't escape. It, it's there. It happened. But God has enough grace to have taken care of that. His blood was sufficient to cover that. When he sees you, he doesn't see that. He sees his son. So, because that is the case, why do we as believers live as though sin is okay? Why do we do it? Why do we live as though sin has no consequence? Why do we live as though it's okay for us to continue sinning so that grace may abound, as Paul would, would really um, go fight against in Romans chapter 5, if you'll turn back there. Contrasting Adam with Christ, you know, Adam, he sinned, and that caused everybody be, to be condemned. Jesus Christ came as the second Adam. He offered his life. And everybody who places their faith in Him, that, that free gift will overcome the condemnation from sin and will give somebody a hope and will give somebody eternal life. But there is a mentality that, oh, I'll just keep sinning so I can get more grace. And um, verse 20, moreover, the, the law entered that the, law, the, the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus our Lord. The mentality was, and maybe for some Christians today still is, well, I can always ask for forgiveness later. I'll just do whatever, I'll indulge now, and then when I feel the hurt, when I feel the consequences, then I'll ask for forgiveness. Parents, we don't appreciate it when our children do that, do we? No. God doesn't appreciate it when we do it. 
And so how does Paul respond? Verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then the rest of chapter 6 goes on to talk about how the fact that we've been saved, so why do we live like we're not? We're saved, why do we allow sin to continue in our lives? We need to take it seriously. Why? Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Now those of us who are saved will not have to pay those wages. Jesus paid them on the cross. But every time we continue sinning, every time we act as though sin is no problem, we're saying, Christ, I don't care what you did for me. I'm going to live how I want. Because I know I got my ticket punched to heaven. In just a few minutes, we're going to observe the Lord's table. And I read in 1 Corinthians 11 to open our service. I'm going to go back there now. In 1 Corinthians 11, after Jesus tells the symbolism of the the bread which he broke, symbolizing his body which would be broken for us, we are to remember him for that, and then the the wine that they drink, the juice that we'll drink, was a testament uh, in his blood. We remember what he did, the blood that he poured out, that perfect precious blood that he spilt on that cross for us that covered our sins. We're to remember his death till he come, and we do so by observing this. But again, Paul... Paul takes this very seriously, and if if this seems a little heavier than normal, okay, that's fine, but we need to take sin seriously, and what we're about to do, while a joyous thing, is also a very serious thing. Serious enough that Paul wrote the words that he wrote, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The Lord took them home. That's how seriously God takes sin in a believer's life. Enough that people were taking the Lord's table lightly. They were taking, more specifically, the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection lightly, and treating His sacrifice for sin lightly, to the point that they took the Lord's table, didn't think anything of it, and God judged them for it. He, he punished them. Now, they, the, the, word, the Bible uses the word judge here. This isn't talking about judgment necessarily. This is for believers, so not judgment to you know, eternal destruction in hell. But this is people who, they receive consequences. They get disciplined by the Lord. And in some cases, they were sick. They were, they were hurt because of this. And there were many that uh, had lost their lives. God took them home because they did not take their walk with him seriously. They didn't take his sacrifice seriously. Folks, the power of the gospel is powerful enough to help you choose to not sin. The power of the gospel is powerful enough to help you grow each day. The power of the gospel is enough to keep you on that right track, to keep sin away. But do we trust that power? Every time we're tempted, do we trust that power to fight that sin? Every time sin knocks, every time we're tempted to look anywhere else except Jesus for pleasure, for satisfaction, for a purpose, the gospel is powerful enough to help us say no to that. The power of the gospel is able to help us to close that door, to leave that door, and to choose, I'm going to honor Christ with my life no matter what it costs, no matter how long it takes. I'm going to do what's right. When the gospel gets a hold of somebody, and I mean it really gets a hold of them, change regularly happens. There's an increased desire to pursue Christ. There's an increased desire to put aside unnecessary weights so that a strong race can be run. Are you pursuing Christ? Are you laying aside the weights that prevent you from running wholeheartedly for Jesus? Perhaps people know who you used to be, And who you used to be isn't good. If they saw you now, would they see a difference? If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, the power of the gospel must be making a difference. If you don't see a difference being made, you might consider whether or not you've truly been saved. If you have not, this can be the day of salvation. Don't wait another hour. You can call upon the name of the Lord tonight and be saved. In a minute, we're going to pray. I'm not going to have uh, an, a, 
invitation for that, but we'll just spend some time in silent prayer, after which I'll have uh, Pastor Wadsworth and Brother John come and prepare the table. But as we pray, this is what you need to do. You need to allow the Lord to examine your heart. You need to welcome that. You need to ask Him to search your heart, to know your thoughts, to see if there be any wicked way in you. And if He shows you something, if He has shown you something through this message, do something about it. If, if there's sin that you're unwilling to confess, then don't, don't partake. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of you. I usually close my eyes uh, so that I can focus on praying and thinking about what the Lord has done. Whether you have your eyes open or closed during the Lord's Supper is inconsequential. But it would be better for you to abstain and to do what you need to do to get right with somebody or with the Lord than to eat and drink unworthily. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, don't partake. This is for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Spend this time of silent prayer, pouring out your heart, opening it to the Lord, exposing it to the power of the gospel, and letting him make a difference. And then after, after about 30 seconds or so, uh, I will pray to conclude this time of prayer, and I'll have the men come and prepare the table. Let's all bow for prayer.